In this time of desperation When all we know is doubt and fear There is only one foundation We believe We believe In this confess that we uh, that our God is a great and glorious God it's why we gather here today so welcome home once again church it is great to be home gathered with you all here today and uh, uh, what a day it is here as we come to celebrate uh, once again if you were part of the celebration last night the fall festival 500 uh, celebrating 500 years uh, since the Reformation. And really what we're celebrating uh, is the gospel, the truth of the gospel uh, and our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ, what he has done for us. And what a better way for us to celebrate here today as we're going to have a baptism, as we look and cling to the promises of God that we receive in baptism, uh, what a great way that is to celebrate. For any guests who are with us here today, uh, we are so glad to have you here with us. Uh, and we want to, if you are a first time guest, we want to have, we have a special gift for you to say, uh, show our appreciation for you to be here. 
And you can pick that up at our Welcome Center, which is out in our fellowship area. And if you don't know exactly where that is, feel free to ask anyone around you, and I'm sure they would be glad uh, and more than willing to guide you there to get that after our service. Uh, well, today here as we gather, it is a bittersweet time as we gather. We know it's sweet because God's word is still going to come. Uh, and Pastor Doug is going to be bringing us a wonderful message once again. Uh, but the bitter part, knowing that this is the last message he will give to us all here, uh, knowing that he is so loved by each and every one of us, uh, and he loves each and every one of you out there uh, so much. And so uh, it is a hard time to say goodbye, but we uh, rejoice in God and all that he has done in and through Pastor Doug and his time here, in and through our lives, uh, through the work that Pastor Doug, the, God, the work that God has done through him. Uh, and so uh, remem remember that here today uh, as we gather in worship once again. Before we get into our worship service, let's take a look at what God is doing here at St. Paul's in the weeks to come with our weekly blueprint. Welcome home, church. We are blessed to have you connected with us in worship, whether it's here in our sanctuary or online at spldecatur.org. At St. Paul's, it is our mission to build the home and change the world, and there are many opportunities to put this mission in action in our lives. Let's dig in together and see what God has in store for us. Here is your weekly blueprint. Ladies, SPL Women's Ministry welcomes guests to experience the life of Jesus through Mary's eyes as a mother remembers this year's Advent by Candlelight event here at SPL on Tuesday, November 14th at 6 p.m. Attendees can help us have a greater impact in our community by bringing birthday gifts for Jesus, selected items for children that will bless families through New Life Pregnancy Center. A list of desired items is available at the Advent by Candlelight table. Men of SPL, if you are available, we do need your help. Sign up to serve with us today. Additionally, the team welcomes donations of needed food items for the event and monetary gifts to help cover costs. Connect with Women's Ministry at their table in the fellowship area. Brighter futures begin here at St. Paul's Early Learning Center. Children ages 6 weeks to 12 years experience the love of Christ daily as they learn, develop, and grow through our daycare, preschool, and school-age programs. You can continue to invest in the growth and learning of these young children by supporting the ELC's current Perfect Pastries fundraiser. A variety of items are available with delivery just in time for the holiday season. Order now through November 6th from the ELC staff, church office, or a participating ELC family. Proceeds will support the purchase of new classroom learning toys and materials. Learn all about what's happening at the ELC by visiting elcdecatur.org or facebook.com slash elcdecatur. Church, there's still one more week to help us gather shoebox gift items for Operation Christmas Child. SPL Kids will be packing shoebox gifts together November 4th, 5th, and 8th, and we'd like to be able to pack as many as we can. You can bring donations of items to the, be placed in the shoeboxes as well as monetary gifts to help cover the $9 per box donation to our table in the fellowship area or to the SPL Kids classrooms. You can still pack on your own, just be sure to return your shoebox and $9 donation to SPL by November 12th. Dig deeper into all that is happening here by referring to your worship guide or connecting with us online at spldecatur.org or through our Facebook page. If you need assistance while you're with us, ushers are ready to help here in the sanctuary or visit our Welcome Center. Now let's get on our feet, church, and get ready to worship. It's time to greet and welcome one another. All right, men, I need you to leave your women and come forward right now. All the men, we're going to be gathering up here. Martin Luther was very big on men being the spiritual leaders in their homes. And so you are going to lead uh, our worship off here this morning. If, if you're one of those men who's still standing in the pew, you're going to look really weird, so you want to come up. We can gather. There's room up here. 
I'm well. Thank you. All right, guys. Come on up.
your seats, guys. Thank you all so very, very much. Just to assure all of you spouses and children out there, my, my kids, when they first heard us sing that song, they said, you wouldn't do anything if they came for us, but uh, I assure you, your men would fight for you. I hope that's not me. All right. Let's begin in that name above all names, the most mighty name any of us know. Let's stand on our feet and begin in his name. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We continue as we hear God's word. Please be seated. The first lesson is a reading from the book of Revelation, chapter 14. Then I saw another angel flying directly overhead with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on earth, to every nation and tribe and language and people. And he said with a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. The second lesson is a reading from the book of Romans, chapter 1. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is proclaimed in all the world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I mention you always in my prayers, asking that somehow by God's will I may now at last succeed in coming to you. For I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. That is, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that I have often intended to come to you, but thus far have been prevented, in order that I may reap some harvest among you, as well as among the rest of the Gentiles. I am under obligation both to the Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. So I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Out of respect for Jesus and his words of life, we stand for the reading of the gospel. The Holy Gospel comes to us this morning from the Gospel of St. John, the 20th chapter. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you've seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Heaven and earth will pass away. Let's sing. Sing, sing with me. He is my rock, my shield, my
Congregation, at this time, you may be seated, and I invite forward our baptismal family, baptismal sponsors. Come right on up here. I just want to say that I think it's quite interesting, and maybe this only happens every 500 years of the Reformation, but last night I was polka dancing with this man, one of our elders, Larry, and here today we are performing a baptism. So we're going to leave, we're going to leave that behind, and we're going to trust that God's doing the work in this, and he uses crazy people like us to make it happen. Sam, Pam, Micah, hear this word from our God. Dearly beloved, Christ our Lord says in the last chapter of Matthew, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And in the last chapter of Mark, our Lord promises, Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. And the Apostle Peter has written, Baptism now saves you. The Word of God also teaches that we are all conceived and born sinful and are under the power of the devil until Christ claims us as his own. We will be lost forever unless delivered from sin, death, and everlasting condemnation. But the Father of all mercy and grace has sent his Son, Jesus Christ, who atoned for the sin of the whole world, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. So Micah, receive the sign of the cross both upon your forehead and upon your heart. Mark, he was one redeemed by Christ Jesus, the crucified. Let us pray. Almighty God, we come to you this day marveling in another miracle, a mystery that we get to behold before our very eyes, that here in this simple water and in your powerful word, you can bind them together to place a seal over Micah that he'll carry for the rest of his life. Remind us again, Father, of the seals you've placed on all of us in our baptisms, that we belong to you forever as your sons and daughters of righteousness. We thank you, God, through Jesus for this gift. It's in his name we pray. Amen. And parents and sponsors, Shannon, Nate, listen to the responsibilities that God is calling you into here this day as you think about coming alongside this child. We know that throughout the church, our, our history and our heritage, we've celebrated uh, sponsors uh, to come over children in their baptism to support them in various ways. And it's really a threefold promise that you're having over Micah here today. First of all, that you would pray for him and that you would remember him in your prayers, asking God to guard and protect his life, his heart, that it would stay soft and tender to this world as he grows up to be the man of God that he is being called to be. And secondly, that you would also teach him the things of faith. When we have moments in life where you can point him back to Jesus and the love that our God has, that you would show those moments to him, connect the dots for him, to show him in the hard times, here's how God is still working. And in the joyous times, here's how much we can thank God for this. And finally, that you would model your own lives after Christ. That when he wants to know what does it mean to try and pursue God, to chase after him, not that we get this totally perfect, but that he can look to you as one who is seeking to follow Christ. So I ask you, parents and sponsors, is this the responsibility that you take hold of this day? If so, then say yes with the help of God. Yes, with the help of God. And God give you his strength and his power to do so. In Jesus' name. And since young Micah here is not able to make this confession on his own, we join together as parents and sponsors, and we join together as the whole Christian church in speaking together the things that we belong to and believe. We speak together the words of the creed. And I'll invite you to speak this after me. I will uh, speak first the, the pastor responses, and I'll invite you to join in uh, with the congregational responses. So join in with me. Do you renounce the devil in all his works and all his ways? I do renounce them. Do you believe in God the Father Almighty? Yes. yes, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And do you believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son? Yes, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. And do you believe in the Holy Spirit? Yes, yes I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. 
And is it your desire then to have Micah baptized? The name Micah means, who is like God? And I love that question. It's a, it's a rhetorical question, but it's also a question that we see answered here in baptism as we see Micah himself becoming like God as God places his seal over him. And so, Micah Oren Morrow, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Shh. Mike, Almighty God has given you a new birth through washing and through his Holy Spirit. He's wiped away all your sins. You are his child of God now and forever. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for what you've just done in this moment, that you have done for us a miracle that we can hold and know in our hearts, that we can know when we, when we think of Micah, we can look to what you've done for him here today and know that he is your son, and you're going to grow him up mighty and strong in this world, and I pray over Sam and Pam for their family as they grow together, God, that you would hold them all close in perfect love and unity. We thank you, Jesus, for the power of you, for your gospel and your love. We ask it all in your name. Amen. Can we welcome this new member of God's family here today, Micah Oren Morrow. And before you go, you know we got a, a few goodies for you. This is the baptismal shell that reminds you of the one that we used here. You can put that up somewhere where Micah can see it and you can see it. You can be reminded of what God did. And this is his baptismal candle. Now, AJ, do you think you can blow this out? No, man, no. You got to. You're going to try? There you go. Oh, you got it. Ready? We'll do it together. Oh, you got it. Nice job, buddy. And this is your little brother's baptismal candle to remind him of his birthday, his baptism birthday. And you can light that on his baptism birthday, okay? And sponsor, Shannon, I'm going to give this to you. There is your certificate of what God is calling you into and the baptismal certificate from Micah. Once again, can we welcome this child to the family of God? As they return to their places, I invite everyone to stand on your feet. One of the great rediscoveries uh, that, that Martin Luther brought forth into the world uh, was that you didn't have to go to a priest, you didn't have to go to a pope to have your sins forgiven. That every last person on earth could come directly to Jesus Christ to confess their sins to him and have him directly forgive you for every last one of them. And so I invite you to join me as we go straight to the big guy and confess our sins to him. Dear Lord Jesus, I feel my sins. They bite and gnaw and terrify me. Where shall I go? I will look to you, Lord Jesus, and believe in you. Although my faith is weak, I look to you and find assurance, for you have promised, he that believes in me shall have everlasting life. My conscience is burdened and my sins make me tremble, but you have said, be of good cheer, your sins are forgiven, and I will raise you up on the last day and you shall have eternal life. I cannot do any of this for myself. I come to you for help. Amen.
and your blood is your life. And just like me, throughout our lives, the sins we have committed have stacked up one upon another. And as God looked at the world and said, who will pay the price for the sins of all of these people? He could find no one strong enough, no one valuable enough to cover us, not all of us. And so he came himself. And it's with his infinitely valuable, holy and precious blood that he made the payment, that he covered every last one of us and forgave every sin that would ever be committed, including yours and mine. So it is my great joy to announce his forgiveness over all of you. My friends, your sins are forgiven in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, as we celebrate 500 years of Reformation, we come to you because we need more. We need that reformation to continue in each and every one of our lives. We need you to change us, Jesus, to become more and more like you. And it's to you that we bring our our most desperate needs. Into your hands we, we lay Carl Graff. I place myself in your hands, Lord, for healing. We place Charlie May and Vicki Derneal and Stu Whitfield, who has just entered into hospice. Lord Jesus, bring healing, bring strength, bring comfort, whatever it might be. All we ask is that you do it according to your will. And what a privilege it is, Lord, to belong to a family far bigger than just our immediate family, bigger than anything we can truly imagine, a family of believers all around this world. And we rejoice with all of them who rejoice And especially in our midst today, we rejoice with Bev and Charlie Brown as they celebrate 16 years of marriage. And we rejoice with Kim Howe and her family upon this, her birthday. Jesus, smile down upon them. And we also, Lord, mourn with those who mourn. This week has been hard for us, Lord. We've lost more than a more than our fair share of loved ones this week. And so we ask that you would comfort the family of Norma Beckmeyer, the family of Lori Harnish, and the family of Juanita Johnson. Lord, you know the pain, you know the loss, you know the grief. Comfort them as only you can. And Lord Jesus, as we look out upon our community, we see people who don't know you, Use us to bring your gospel to them. We see people who are hurting. Use us, Lord, to bring hope, to bring healing to those lives as well. There are those who are afraid. Lord, use us to bring courage and strength. Just use us, Lord. Use us. We ask all of these things in your precious name, Jesus, and all God's people said. Jesus, once again, teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated, church. Who here had a chance to come to that celebration yesterday? Wasn't that absolutely amazing? Can we thank everybody who made that possible? A lot of work went into that and some pretty great expense. And and to continue to make things like that happen, 
Uh, we need your generosity. And so we are asking all of our members to please give generously during this time. But if you're a guest of ours, just being here is your gift to us today. We don't expect you to give anything at all. But we do invite also our members and our guests during this time to fill out those attendance cards in front of you. Uh, you'll place your offerings in the basket and you'll pass those cards down to the center aisles and we'll collect those after we uh, collect your offerings. At St. Paul's, we value worshiping together as a family of faith. We also value providing our kids an opportunity to dig deeper and connect with God at their age and stage. So, now is the time for SBL Kids Worship. If you'd like to participate, little ones aged six weeks to three years can engage in Bible time in our nursery. And kids ages three years through fourth grade can join with our SBL Kids team leaders in the fellowship area. Parents, if you did not have an opportunity to check in your child before worship, please accompany them to the SBL Kids table at this time. Dig in, kids, and have a great time in worship.
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, call us back to the amazing truth of your gospel. Free us from the danger of self-reliance and from trusting in anything, anything other than you. There is nowhere else for us to go, nothing else we can turn to. You alone have the words of eternal life. In Jesus' name, amen. We are here today on this Reformation Sunday to celebrate a most crucial moment in history. It was a moment unlike any other that changed everything, a time when a certain man saw the evils of the day and knew that something needed to be done. A time when someone stood up and was not afraid to speak truth, no matter what it might mean for his own personal safety. Someone who didn't give in to the ruling authorities and powers of the day, no matter how popular and influential their position. Some despised him for the stance that he took. And in other people's eyes, he could do no wrong. But everyone who met him knew. He spoke with complete conviction and amazing authority. We're here today to celebrate the work of this man and the lasting contribution that he made to the church and world. We're here today to celebrate this one person, Jesus of Nazareth. Amen? Amen. I hope you're not disappointed. Yes, it's true that 500 years ago, a professor named Martin Luther posted 95 theses in Wittenberg, Germany. And those 95 statements would challenge the ways that the Catholic Church had been practicing religion, how they had deviated from the truths of Scripture. It's true that these statements would make their way up to Pope Leo himself, that these challenges, they couldn't be ignored. And Luther's own life would be endangered for taking that stand. It's true that he especially fought against the selling of indulgences, an act of buying forgiveness from the church as something so far from what God intended. And Luther had seen how this practice had motivated God's people by fear and guilt and a false sense of security. So he had to do something about it. He had to speak up. And his actions did change the shape of the church indefinitely from that moment on. But I think, I think Martin Luther would be the first to tell you that the Reformation was not about Luther. It was always and only about Jesus. Luther stood on scriptures like Romans 1, 16 and 17, for I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. He clung to the promise that the gospel was a work that rested only in God's hands. It's his power that changes us and rescues us. And this new life, it comes to us by faith, by trusting that what God is doing is enough for us. It's Jesus Nothing more and nothing less. No matter how much pride or guilt you have in yourself, our only hope is to fix our eyes on Jesus. Luther once wrote, Your conscience will be terrified by the recollection of your past sins. The devil will attack you vigorously and will try to swamp you with piles and floods and whole oceans of sin in order to frighten you, draw you away from Christ, and plunge you into despair. Then you must be able to say with confident assurance, Christ, the Son of God, was given not for righteousness and not for saints, but for unrighteousness and for sinners. If I were righteous and without sin, I would have no need of Christ as my propitiator, that is, my satisfaction maker before God. This is what gave the Reformation its power. It wasn't like Luther and the other reformers discovered something new or set out to do life in church in a totally different way. They were only recovering something that had been lost and covered up. And they helped people around them see once again that God's gracious love is a free gift to all. It can't be purchased or won by us. In fact, we were the possessions that needed to be bought back. The only payment that would satisfy was the precious blood and the innocent suffering and death of a Savior. The only thing that would do was Jesus. 
this is the gospel. This is the good news that when God loves something, he initiates and he completes the rescue of it. He sends his only son so we can believe in him and inherit that eternal life. It's the Sunday school answer. It's something you've heard so many times before. It's something you don't always want to hear, but it's something that we absolutely need to hear. It's the tr truth you've heard time and time over again. So much so that sometimes its majesty starts to fade away and escape us. And we lose sight of how much this whole thing is simply about being with and belonging to Jesus. He's the one of whom Paul said, while we were still sinners, he died for us. Even on your worst day, God never regrets sending Jesus for you. You didn't have to please him first. God said, Jesus is my son, and in him I am well pleased. You didn't have to find him first. Jesus said, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go out and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And whatever you ask for in my name, the Father will give you. Can you imagine what it must have been like for Luther when he really experienced this grace and gospel message for the first time? I mean, when he fully captured and realized that God wasn't just looking down on him in anger and never-ending disappointment. And can you imagine the sweetness of this message to his ears? Maybe it was like, hearing for the first time. Maybe it was something like this. Oh, <laughs> it's, it's like so close. There you go. We're not right over it. There you go. It's beeping. So now technically your device is on. Can you tell? Oh, that's exciting. Here, you can put it down for a second. Just get used to the sound. <laughs> what does it sound like? love that clip and I love what it looks like to get to see someone healed that we have advances in technology so that someone's ears could be opened up that she could really hear for the first time in her life and I love it because it makes me think about the kind of healings that Jesus did the miracles he performed how he specialized in the opening up of eyes and ears and tongues of the blind and the deaf and the mute I wonder if Jesus did these kinds of healings for a reason that along with the amazing gift of restoration it gave to someone's body, to their senses, that these miracles also had a way of being a kind of precursor, a foreshadowing to show the kind of work that the gospel would do for us spiritually. That when Jesus won victory for us on the cross, when he left the tomb empty, our hearts could finally be opened up enough to see just how deeply his love cuts, how every broken person past, present, and future would be covered by his sacrifice and sin, death, and the devil beaten for all time. The Apostle Paul prayed that we would receive this kind of healing. He told the church, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. Friends, this hope is Jesus. The reason for the Reformation is Jesus and Jesus alone. He is our only rock, our fortress, our strong tower worth standing on and belonging to and finding shelter in. Do you come here to be with Jesus? I hope you do. Do you see Jesus when you walk through the doors to this sanctuary? Do you see the love in his eyes that he has for you, the ways he knows you and cares about you? Do you feel his touch as he reaches out his hand towards you, beckoning you to come and find rest in him? 
I don't know about you, but I tend to come here with a lot of things that fill my mind as I enter this place. I come here with worries, to-dos, people to talk to, kids to look after and teach, coffee to drink, prayers to read over, messages to prep, and things like this. They're all good things, but they are not the most needful thing. Sometimes I've forgotten that the first and foremost reason I have ever entered this space is to be with Jesus. 500 years later and the church hasn't stopped struggling with letting Jesus be enough. Sometimes I forget that even though I bring all these things with me, the first thing I come to do in the morning is to give them to Jesus so that he can teach me again to cast all my cares and anxieties on him who cares for me. So that I can have that all-important revelation once again that this world and even my own life are things that don't depend on me. I fight from his victory and never for it. And no matter how brilliant and influential any of us are, the Christian faith does not depend on any one of us. I remember one of my biggest Lutheran wake-up calls when it came to how I thought about my own LCMS heritage and Martin Luther himself. And growing up, Luther was always somebody that was held very highly. He was idolized in my mind as this amazing hero of the faith who saved the church by calling out all its heresy and bringing the Bible to every German man, woman, and child. These were proud Lutheran stories I grew up on. And while there is a lot of great and amazing things that God did with Luther's life, he kind of became to me this mythological creature a superhuman figure. Fast forward to my vicarage internship in 2013. I was in Macomb, Michigan, and I was on a trip chaperoning a bunch of eighth graders to a trip to Washington, D.C., and one of our stops on this trip was the Holocaust Memorial Museum. And I remember exploring all the different exhibits, the somber reminders of what that genocide did to this world. And I came across this exhibit. It was called the Propaganda Room. And in the propaganda room, there was a projector screen showing about a 20-minute video of some of the people and things that influenced Adolf Hitler and his regime to do the things that they did. I kept watching my 8th grade students come in and out of this room with sad and mortified looks on their faces, which was understandable given where we were. But then finally, another adult chaperone pulled me aside and said, you might want to go see that for yourself. So I took a seat, and it wasn't long at all until I understood why they were having the reaction they were. You see, in this video, they cited Martin Luther as someone who was directly responsible for in influencing Adolf Hitler and his atrocities against the Jewish people. It turns out, Luther wrote a paper called On the Jews and Their Lies. Luther wrote this at the end of his life. He wrote it with much anger and embitterment toward Jewish people who were unwilling to see Jesus as Lord and Savior. And Luther, in his anger, had given up on converting them. And instead, he called for things like their schools and synagogues to be burned, for their possessions to be taken away from them, for their rabbis to be stripped of their duties, and even for the people to be forced into labor. I watched in horror. I tried to think about what I was supposed to tell a bunch of 8th graders who've grown up in a Lutheran church in school. How could I defend this great pioneer of the faith? But after a while, I realized I couldn't. There was nothing I could say to defend what Luther said. So I did the only thing that I could do. I told them as great as Luther was and is to us, as many awesome things as God allowed him to take part in to bring the comforting truth of the gospel to the people, he was still just a man. And he was just in, as much in need of that grace as anyone else. A crucial thing happened to us on that trip. That propaganda room, it actually made the gospel shine that much brighter. It showed us that the only power that rests in someone like Martin Luther and in an event like the Reformation is the ability and the willingness of someone to point back to Christ alone. Luther was just that willing servant to be used by God in that moment 
with all of his brilliance and his bitterness, with all his saintliness and his sin. And friends, God can use any one of us for that purpose. It's how the power of the gospel works. It's by grace that you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. This is God's work in us. It changes us. It makes us who we are, and when God shows up, he gets all the glory for what happens in our lives to the good. Because this gospel makes us God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do these good works, which God has prepared in advance for us to do. When you've been changed by this gospel, you'll have the chance to take a stand and do a good work. Church, Luther's moment, it was 500 years ago. Our moment is now. And the Holy Spirit is just as willing to shake the ground on which we stand as he was back then. Will you become a thermostat in a world of thermometers? Will you be a a thermostat in a world of thermometers? Will you change the climate? Will you be someone who's willing to leverage your own influence to sacrifice and give it everything you've got to change the atmosphere around you for the sake of this gospel? Anyone can be a thermometer. Anyone can read the climate. Anyone can decry the state of being that we're in. Anyone can criticize the powers that be and post angry thoughts of complaint and contempt. But are you willing to take a stand? Are you willing to take a stand in a way that points people to Jesus? Are you willing to show people that it's not just about what you stand against? It's about what you stand for and stand on. That it's all about Jesus. And if Jesus is not enough, nothing in your life will ever be enough. I know that this is a place where that can happen. I've seen it happen. And I can't tell you what a tremendous honor it's been for me to be a pastor in this place. St. Paul's is a church filled with a vibrant life that makes you feel all at the same time part of something amazing, yet something so familiar and so down to earth. It's filled with people who aren't afraid to dare greatly for the cause of this gospel that has captured your hearts and your souls. Don't ever lose that. But the greatest thing, the greatest thing about this place is it's a place where Jesus lives and reigns. You can be with him here. No matter your background, no matter your pedigree, No matter what you're dealing with, no matter the past that haunts you, no matter who preaches from this pulpit, no matter who who hands you your cup of coffee or who sings in this choir or who plays in that praise team, no matter who shakes your hand at the door or leads your Bible study, this is a place where all of us get to be with Jesus. And it's where we see Jesus in others. And it's where we go out to point people to Jesus who are beyond us. Friends, I want you to know, I will miss you terribly. But don't you ever forget, it's always been, and it will always be, about Jesus. In the name of our all in all, in the name of the great reformer of our souls, in Jesus' name, amen. And now may the peace of that passes all understanding, may it guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus unto that life everlasting. In Jesus' name, amen. I still got to give the blessing, so don't get me too, too started up here. Receive God's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. 
The Lord look upon you with his favor. And may he give you his peace. Amen. Let's sing. <laughs> send Pastor Doug here in just a second, but there are three groups of people I want to, or three types of people I want to invite up here right now. Doug and Michelle, you guys come up here. I'd like to also invite any youth that have been part of their ministry to come forward. I want the youth to lay hands on them as we send them out. And my wife is going to be here too because she wants to be. <laughs> I learn, I learn. And I also want to invite Matt Black. Where are you at, Matt? Uh, 
as, as sad as we are to say goodbye to these two, uh, Matt Black and Matthew Greenwald are two teachers at the Lutheran School Association. Matt, just stand right up here real quick. I just want to introduce you to them. They're teachers at the LSA who are stepping in to be our new youth leaders part-time. So would you please welcome uh, Matt Black for me, stepping into that role. All right, now you can, you can come stand over here with me. And what I want all of us to do, kids, you just lay hands on those two. Everybody else lift up a hand of blessing over them. Douglas Bender. We peacefully release you as our pastor here at St. Paul's Indicator. And Lord Jesus, we pray that you would put your hand of protection, that you would set your holy angels guard over, over Pastor Doug and Michelle and Nora, that you would keep them from all physical harm. And Lord Jesus, we pray for favor over their lives, uh, that, that their, their home would be sturdy and lasting, that, that the work of their hands in, in Wisconsin would, would, be, would be so fruitful, Lord, that they would be amazed and everyone would be amazed at the work that you are doing through them. And Lord, we pray for their influence, that, that every life that comes into their orbit would get to experience you that they would be change agents of your gospel for the sake of your kingdom and to your glory every day of their lives. And I would invite the congregation now to repeat after me. Doug and Michelle, Doug and Michelle. We, send we send you out into the frozen tundra of Wisconsin. Frozen tundra of Wisconsin. Go in peace. Go in, power. Go in power. Go in the name of Jesus. Go in the name of Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Go, guys. Blessings to you all. Go in peace, everybody. All right. Let them hear it. You two go out this way, and they're all going to greet you on the other side. Blessings, everybody. Go in peace.